Welcome to the fifth segment of A Journey Through Assyrian History. In the last few segments, we went over understanding Assyrian history and also among or over what Western authors or Western missionaries uh, came to understand as the Assyrian people. This was, from their perspective, a discovery of sorts although the Assyrians themselves wouldn't say they were discovered naturally, the Western writers, uh, largely missionaries, felt that the Assyrians had been discovered after many centuries of um, being unknown, as it were, in historical records. So once the missionaries and other Western scholars interacted with the Assyrians in the late 18th and early 19th century, something changed about the Assyrians. Of course, they were being exposed to new ideas and new ways of thinking. Um, Assyrians began to understand their ethnic background as being more important, if not as important, as their religious background. Remember now, they were Christians belonging to various sects of Christianity or various churches within the Christian world, um, various churches that had been isolated from the Western churches. And so when missionaries came and interacted with the Assyrians, there were schools that were created. Um, in addition to the benefits of the schools that were created and the greater education, there was a fragmenting of the religious Assyrian body, which was largely the Church of the East and the Syriac Orthodox Church into various entities. Eventually, we wound up with the Church of the East, which became two parts, the ancient Church of the East and the Assyrian Church of the East, the Chaldean Church, which broke apart in the 1500s, and then earlier, the Syriac Orthodox Church, which was broken up um, on lines of Christology, one being a um, Monophysite church, which believed in the oneness of the natures of Christ, and the other being a Diophysite church, which believed in the two natures of Christ. The Nestorian, or Church of the East, being uh, adhering to two natures of Christ, and the Syriac Orthodox Church adhering to one nature, one godly nature of Christ. Now, when American missionaries and other Western missionaries come to the Assyrians, to various areas they lived, the result is that the Assyrian uh, people and church begin to fragment into various entities. So here we begin to have um, the Latin uh, Rite Assyrians or Chaldean Assyrians in, uh, for example, areas such as Urmia, which were exclusively Church of the East. We begin to have uh, adherence to the Russian Orthodox Church we begin to have adherence to the American Presbyterian mission as well as other missions. When this fragmentation resulted among the Assyrians in the late 19th and early 20th century, Assyrians began to rediscover their roots, as it were. They began to find ways to bridge their collective entity together. And so one of those bridges that was used to bring themselves together as a people in the abstract, of course, was the idea of nationalism. The idea that they had one identity, ethnic or national identity, that was separate from their religious identity. This was something new. Now, people may think that naturally the idea of nationalism is a very ancient idea, but that's not true. Um, among the French and English, for example, the very expression nationality was ac accepted only in 1835. 1835, that's relatively late. Among the Assyrians, the development of nationalism came late in the 18th century, so in the late 1800s. Now, Assyrian nationalism, or an understanding of Assyrian nationalism, um, and the building or rebuilding of Assyrian identity comes in three stages. The first stage is late 1800s to just prior to the First World War, 
when the intellectuals in the city of Urmia, in particular, begin to develop this idea of a link with the ancient Assyrian past. If not to develop the, uh, if not to rediscover the idea, then to enhance that idea of belonging to an ancient past. The second stage takes place after the First World War and up until after, just after the Semele massacre of 1933. So we're talking between 1915, uh, the First World War, and then 1934, when the Semele massacre has occurred and the Assyrian movement, particularly in Iraq, has been crushed and has gone, in effect, underground. The last period of the development of Assyrian nationalism takes place post-1934 and up until the present. We're going to focus in this segment on the early period involving the intellectuals in Urmi. So, late 1800s until the First World War. Now, what had happened here? As we said, the combined influence of missionaries from the West and their activities, as well as the Russians, and Russian military advances into the Caucasus and confronting the Ottoman Empire and winning several battles, um, led the Assyrians to have a new outlook uh, as to their ethnicity and their rights. And this was particularly so among the intellectuals in Urmia. Here, the Assyrians were beginning to acquire a new type of Western education and were developing in their various uh, professions and a merchant class was growing. Uh, doctors were now prevalent, many more than before, as well as other professions that led to the acquisition of wealth and so economic betterment among the Assyrians. As well, schools were beginning to grow. In the hundreds of villages in Urmia, many, many Assyrian schools began to develop. This was also a time when the Assyrians began to publish in their own language, for the first time through printing presses, Assyrian periodicals. In the entire Middle East, the very first periodical that was published was an Assyrian periodical, Zarir al-Bahra, Ray of Light which was being assisted, of course, this effort was being assisted by American missionaries, but the first magazine ever to be published in the Middle East was an Assyrian magazine. That's an interesting fact. 1838 was when Zarir al-Bahra was first published in the town of Urmia. It was not only the first periodical in Iran, but the first periodical in the entire Middle East. This was... Um, a development that the Assyrians took pride in, and later it was followed by a magazine called Kuchwa, the Star, which in effect sought to bring Assyrian, um, the Assyrian people together because as they themselves had viewed it, Assyrians were no longer one church or one community or, or one millet, to use a term in the Ottoman um, expression. Now the Assyrians were many different sects. They belonged to the Russian Orthodox, to the American Presbyterian, to the Anglican and um, uh, French uh, missions, uh, the Chaldean Church, and so on. Well, in addition to being members of the Church of the East and being all of these other members, the community didn't feel the oneness that it once felt. It did not have the hierarchy and the leadership that it once had. So what was to remedy this situation? According to Kukwa, the stress was now on language and culture and a new history. Not really new in the sense of being completely new and divorced from the past, but a new way of looking at history that had come before. And what was this? The Assyrians began to understand their links with the ancient past and began to, understand, began to understand the importance of stressing that past. So one very important intellectual at this time was Binyamin Arsanas. Binyamin Arsanas wrote in Kichwa, and he wrote a very important article. 
And that article resonates with Assyrians today because the sectarian differences among Assyrians continue to plague uh, this nation. His article was termed, We are Assyrians, not Syriacs or Syrians and Chaldeans. What he meant, of course, was that not that the term Chaldean or Syriac, Suriaya or Chaldaya, did not apply to Assyrians. He meant that we need to dig deeper than words such as Syriac and Chaldean into something that signified a more coherent and continuous past. And that continuous past was represented by the word Assyrian, Aturaya. He was assisted by others such as Dr. Freydun bit Auraham, who was known as Dr. Freydun Aturaya, who also advocated the going back to the roots in effort to understand and render more significant language and culture in Assyrian history rather than religion. Along with Binyamin Arsanis, Dr. Freydun Aturaya or Dr. Freydun Auraham joined Dr. Hakim Baba Parhat to found the first Assyrian Socialist Party in 1907. Now this party was not really politically active in the sense of coming up with programs, advocating for changes, but it gave the Assyrians something to think about. So this was an effort for the Assyrians to start thinking not just about their religious background, but also, and more importantly, to understand their roots in terms of land and culture and history and identity. So the language of the nationalists was transcending the religious differences between the Assyrians. The Assyrians came to find that they were now split into many different um, uh, sects or churches or denominations and that something had to bring them together. And it was this thing that Freydun Aturaya and Binyamin Ersanis and Hikim Baba Parhat pointed to that was of the utmost importance. And that thing, as we said, was their history or their understanding of their history. Dr. Freydun Aturaya felt that young Assyrians understanding their history would be something of significance. It would be something that would lift them out of the current crisis of being fragmented into many different denominations and churches. Gradually, the Assyrians who were professionals began to staff various missionary enterprises in the town of Urmia, and the Assyrian community seems to be having at this time the highest literacy rate in the country of Iran, being the most educated among all of the ethnic groups, and that includes the Persians. So it was among these people, these educated people, particularly Western educated elite among the Assyrians, and including priests and bishops, for example, the French educated Martuma Odu, who became the Chaldean bishop of Urmia, that nationalism was taking root. Martuma Odu is very significant because in his dictionary, the terms Suriaya or Syriac or Syrian, and Keldaya or Chaldean and Athuraya come together. How? The title of the dictionary in the Assyrian language is Lexikon Lishana Suriaya, or Lexicon of the Syriac language, if we're to translate it verbatim. Inside of the book, in the French language, it is translated as the Chaldean language, so lingua Chaldean. However, inside of the book itself, footnote number one explains that the term Suriaya or Syriac or Syrian comes from the word Assyrian or Aturaya. So for Martuma Odu, his ethnicity, his understanding of what his nationality was, was Assyrian. Even though the Assyrian people used terms to designate themselves as Chaldean or Syriac, the proper term for Martuma Odu was Assyrian. And it's very clear in his dictionary. Now, 
As I said, one of the best systematic sources to study about this period was the um, magazine Kichwa, or the periodical Kichwa. It was really a newspaper termed Ruzlama by, at that time. Kichwa was a bi-weekly uh, periodical, which ran from 1906 until 1914, when the First World War occurred. Now, Kichwa was independent, unlike Zarir al-Bahra, which was really sponsored by American missionaries. Kichwa was an independent periodical published by Assyrians. And its goals were to reunite a people that were fragmented by um, sectarianism, really fragmented through Western missions, fragmented through Western influence. At the same time, Western influence also led as, it much, as much as it led to a problem, which was the fragmentation, the denominational fragmentation, it also led to a solution in the minds of the intellectuals. What was the solution? It was, again, a reference to the ethnic or national identity of the Assyrians. And other writers uh, aided people like Benjamin Asanis, um, Freydun Aturaya, or Dr. Freydun Betauraham, and Hakim Baba Parhat, all the way across into the Ottoman realm, where Tur ad-Din and Harput were members of the Syriac Orthodox Church, members of the Jacobite faith, quote-unquote, such as Naum Fayyad and Ashur Yusuf, were also raising the banner of identity. Ashur Yusuf believed that to get ourselves out of the situation that we find ourselves in, again, fragmentation and backwardness, illiteracy and so on, as well as sectarianism, we need to go back to our roots, our roots of understanding ourselves as a great nation, the nation of Assyria. Same with Naum Fayyad, who also around this time, late 19th and early 20th century, was calling for Assyrians to be united and to rally around their ethnic heritage. So what we see among the early intellectuals of the Assyrians is a desire to go back, to go back to an ancient past that would lead us to progress in terms of thinking about our ethnicity, about our nationality, about our existence in today's world. The sum of what these intellectuals were doing, what could say is, they were attempting like all other ethnicities at this time, to go back to their roots for the purpose of empowering themselves. It was perceived that thinking along national lines or ethnic lines rather than religious lines would lead one to become more powerful politically, economically, territorially, and eventually, if it was permitted, militarily. Now, the Assyrians never had that chance because just as they were developing this new form of identity, of understanding their oneness to bridge the gaps between the various sects and denominations, a great event occurred that tossed the entire world into chaos. What was that? It was, of course, World War I. Now, to understand the nationalism of the Assyrians, one must understand what was it that the early Assyrian nationalists, the intellectuals, were thinking about. And we're going to go back in time in the next segment and look at that history which the Assyrians sought to perceive as bringing them back to the oneness that they had lost in the 20th century. I'll see you in the next segment. And I hope you'll be there to join me into discovering the very ancient Assyrian past. Thank you.